Right, so we're discussing the idea that if we turned on a, a, a particle of mass, or if we were to find a particle of mass at a particular location in a particular time, it could take some, some uh, spreading out of gravity as you get further and further away from that mass, and gravity would, would uh, essentially get spread out over increasingly large areas. Just like if you turned on a light bulb and the intensity of light gets spread out over increasingly large areas, and that's why if you're far from a light bulb, it's dim, and when you're close to a light bulb, it's quite bright, because the intensity from that light bulb is getting spread out over different amounts of area as you get closer or further from a light bulb. So here's, a gravity, here's gravity spreading out as you get further and further from a mass. Here's the center of mass at the center of that mass, as you might expect. And out here, far from the mass, I'm going to draw myself a square. Okay, you don't have to ask why just yet. It's going to become hopefully apparent in just a second. Okay, now that I have a square, I'm going to use my ruler again, and I'm going to draw lines going from the vertices of the square back to the center of mass. And you probably recognize this kind of a strategy from art class. You know that vanishing point. A lot of times, grade nine art teachers make you draw like a city, a city street or something with a vanishing point and all the perspective stuff vanishes back to one point. You guys do this thing in art? Okay. Pretty common stuff. It's good for projections. <clears throat> good for perspective. For this one, it's a projection though. And so we've got gravity. More or less, the idea is that there's, there's a concept of gravitational field getting projected out into space away from the mass in a particular direction. So I've got that green square there. I want to draw a red square now. And the red square, and I'm being very intentional, is going to be, if I broke up this line into three segments, one segment, two segments, three segments, the red square is going to be at the end of that second segment. So a vertical line up, a horizontal line over, Another vertical line up, and a horizontal line over. <coughs> and again, at the end of the first segment, I'm going to do a blue square. Vertical line up, horizontal over, vertical up, horizontal over. So this is gravity. And you know, when you're at this point, is the area that gravity is concentrated into smaller or bigger than at this point? Smaller, right? So if the gravity is concentrated into a smaller area as it gets projected away from this mass, stronger or weaker? What do you say? I see three people mouthing the answer. Stronger? Stronger. Yeah. Stronger. The gravitational field intensity is more concentrated as you get closer and closer to the mass. Now I want to label this up a little bit differently, or a little bit more. I want to say that if I draw a dotted line down here, from here to here, from the center of mass out to that first square, I'm going to say is one unit of distance away. And I could say that from the center of mass out to the second square, I could call it two units of distance away. And so by the time I get out to the third square, how many units of distance away am I? You guys are so chatty. What is it? Three. Three. Three units of distance away. All right. Now I want to point out a pattern to you. And it's a pattern that might be obvious to some, but not always to others. Um, if I split this up four ways, can you see that just one of these areas is equal to the original area? My, my diagram isn't perfect, but can you believe it? It is. Okay. How many areas of equal size to this blue area do you think are going to be in the big green area? What do you think? Yeah, Kara? No, you're close though. It's not eight. I'll show you. What if I do this? Okay, if I split it up nine ways. Each of those areas is pretty close. If I drew it perfectly, they'd be exactly the same to that first area. Turns out that this has nine units of area, this has four units of area, and this has one unit of area <clears> that <throat> the gravity gets spread out over. Here's what I want you to notice. What's three squared? Nine. 
What's two squared? What's one squared? It's a connection, right? We call it an inverse square law. In other words, as I get two units away, the area over which the gravity has to be spread is four times greater. As I get three units away, the area over which gravity gets spread is nine times greater than the original. Can you sort of see that visually? Real nice geometric way to think about it. And so we, we do still have this property, and we said it before, so we'll say it again, that force due to gravity, oh, I shouldn't say we weren't using that notation anymore. We were using force of mass one acting on mass two, or we could say, really, in this case, it's more appropriate to say the gravitational field intensity is proportional to one over r squared, an inverse square. <coughs> so I want to borrow for some, from some earlier discussion. Earlier, we said that force of two acting on one, or really, let's call it um, big G for gravity. Gravitational force, big G, not little g, because we've used little g before. We, we did use that in a specific situation where you're near the Earth's surface. In general, F big G is such that F big G is proportional to mass one times mass two over r squared. That's something that I think that we can, we can sort of claim based on Cavendish's experiment. And I would feel fairly confident about that. Now the thing is, if I calculate F big G values and I calculate values for particular masses and the distances between them, I can actually graph those values. And if I were to graph those values, on a graph so that the vertical axis was the gravitational force felt between two objects and the horizontal axis was all the values for mass one times mass two over the distance between those two objects squared. I actually calculated values for those mass ones, the mass twos, and the distance between them. And I used that as my x coordinate. And then I measured the force of gravity between the two respective masses. And I used that as my y coordinate. I could plot a graph and it was done. Um, Cavendish did it, but lots of people have done it since. What they did was, or what they found was, the graph was a nice straight line. And people thought, holy moly, we're onto something. This is huge. If every mass, our pair of masses, at every different distance apart, produces a graph that's a straight line all the time, this is like secret of the universe type stuff. Universal law type stuff. They thought got really excited. Um, so they said, hey, you know what, what I like to do with line graphs? I always like to find the slope. Why not, right? Let's find the slope. So they, they found the slope of this thing. Because if it's always the same line for every pair of masses at every different combination of distances, we always get the same line, then the slope must be important. It must be really important. So rise over run. We say F big G over mass 1, mass 2, over r squared. Turns out that it happens to equal 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11, and the units end up being newtons for force, and it ends up being uh, per meter squared per kilogram, I mean, uh, per kilogram squared per meter squared, but if you invert and multiply, it ends up being uh, meter squared per kilogram squared. Turns out that that was the slope of this, lo this line that seems so magical. Not magical, scientific. <clears throat> What's that? Meter, meter squared per kilogram squared. Yeah, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Happens to be the slope of this really fancy graph. Um, if I take what's in the denominator over here up to the top, you end up getting an expression that looks like this. So I'll write it again, but I'll write it in a different color so you can see that it's a new line. F big G, force due to gravity, is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared times meter mass 1 times mass 2 over the distance between the two ma uh, masses squared. We get this, this equation. What this equation really is telling us is that we could figure out what the force of gravity is between any two, any two masses, as long as we know their mass, 
and as long as we know how far apart they are. So really, uh, if you ha do you have a mass? Yeah, you have a mass, right? Uh, Kevin, you have a mass, right? Right? Are you guys a certain distance away from each other? Yeah? According to Newton's universal law of gravitation, you guys are attracted to each other. Oh. But, Thompson, don't get carried away. Because you're attracted to everybody around you. Yeah, look at the look on his face, eh? And you can figure out to what degree by finding out your mass and then each of the people's masses around you. And you could figure out precisely how attracted you are to Kara. How att attracted you are to Chris. How attracted you are to, to, to uh, well, any, anybody. I'll, I'll stop embarrassing you. All right, but you could figure out, you could calculate it, how attracted you are to them. But the cool thing is, this is the first attracted force of attraction that you have towards them. Tell me, if I turned you into mass two and them into mass one, what's the force of attraction that they have towards you? Yeah? Equal but opposite. Equal but opposite. You got it. So as attracted as I am to the people in my life, this makes me really feel special. <laughs> even, even more than my mom telling me I'm special, this makes me feel special. I know that I'm attracted to the people in my life, according to Newton's universal law of gravitation, but they are equally attracted to me. And the attraction, <laughs> the attraction increases as we get closer. It also, <laughs> it also increases as I gain mass. So whatever. I mean, it's, it's physics, right? <laughs> anyway. So it's, it's a nice little relationship. Um, the units are derived units. The values are experimentally determined values. Now, people short form this because it gets written a lot. The mutual force of attraction between masses uh, is something that's a a universal thing, and you might call it Newton's universal law of gravitation. In fact, that's exactly what I'd like to call it, Newton's universal law of gravitation. But instead of writing 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared over and over again, because it's a bit of a tongue twister, people say F big G is equal to G times M1, oopsie, M2 over R squared, where G is just that placeholder for Newton's universal gravitational constant, okay? 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And yes, you need to know the units, and yes, you need to know the value, okay? It's kind of like gravity, because it is gravity. 